From the farms all across the land From the driftless Middle West to Vietnam In the late 60s, Dubuque, Iowa, nestled along the bluffs of the Mississippi River, was a thriving city. A young local reporter named John McCormick worked for the Telegraph Herald, known as the TH. He would later go on to Newsweek magazine and run the editorial desk at the Chicago Tribune. He was assigned the Danny Hafel story. A lot of people would think of a small town in Iowa as full of old people, kind of a dead economy. Not at all. When Dan Hafel came out of high school, he came into a, a good times and a prosperous community. For those of us who grew up at that time around Dubuque, jobs all over the place. The biggest meatpacking plant in the world was in Dubuque, 4,000 good jobs. John Deere, 7,000 very good jobs making construction, logging equipment. Dan had all kinds of options. There was a lot of money in Dubuque, and young people were spending it. They were buying cars, they were buying boats. They were living a good life along the Mississippi River. But there were also people fighting a war in Vietnam. And most of them would do their, their time, their 13 months, they'd come back just fine. Everyone in Dubuque knew someone who was fighting in Vietnam. And every young person in Dubuque knew someone who'd been killed there. In a clannish place like Dubuque, every death in Vietnam was a tragedy but it wasn't a political event. We weren't debating the pluses and minuses of this war. The notion was, you got a draft letter in the mail, that meant somebody needed you, you went. It, it all started with, uh, I guess, quitting high school. You know, I knew I was gonna be drafted sooner or later. And I was 18, it was like, well, I'm not waiting for the draft. I, I'm gonna sign up, I can get back home and, and be young yet. There were lots of great jobs. Dan could have found work in Dubuque. The fact that he enlisted in the military and asked to go to Vietnam says more about him than it says about the times. I knew that's where I was headed. No high school education, you know, no skills really at anything but farming, you know, so it's like, well, I know I'm gonna be going to Vietnam and fight infantry, I know that. Yeah, my brothers, you know, seven of them was in the service before me. So I was like, well, they all went in. They served their country. God, I'm going to serve my country. Uh, um, but not to say I didn't think about Canada. I thought about it a couple of times. It's like, well, I can't disgrace myself and my family for that. No, I'll just take my chances. I'll go to Vietnam. I'll get through this. I'll get back home. And, well, then, then, then things change. <laughs> The Hafels of North Buena Vista, Balltown, and Guttenberg were hard-working German immigrants that farmed as a way of life and served their country with a sense of duty that was simply expected, with the Hafel in uniform for 25 straight years. I'm Bob Hafel, and I'm Dan's younger brother. Spring was always getting ready for planting, you know, just all that field work. A couple of us would do chores, Somebody always on a tractor, doing whatever. And then the fall, the same way, harvesting them crops. The winter, taking care of cattle. Shoveled and forked a lot of manure. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's how we spent our Saturdays, with a pitchfork in your hand. Every Saturday. We had hogs, we had cattle, we milked cows. We had, everybody had chickens, big gardens. And a lot, lot of labor intensive, of course, but everybody had like bigger families to, uh, to, to do all the work. We're determined. We have good hearts. Um, dedicated. Um, values. Family. Yeah, we had a big family. There was 
Uh, Danny was, what, number 13. The only one after him made the 14, yeah. And uh, he was born at home. The Hafel boys all worked hard and played hard. And Dan, he was one of the best. Oh, he was a little stinker. <laughs> He got into a little trouble actually when he was running around with mom quite a bit. Dan, <laughs> he was kind of a, we were all kind of devils. We had nuns for teachers and we did our best to terrify him and he was one of the best. He was one of the best. I saw a nun take a great big thick album of Peter and the Wolf and hit him, walk up behind him and hit him and alongside the head with it so hard that she knocked him out of his desk. <laughs> but that's the way we all were. <laughs> I remember a lot of times being out at the farm and him and Bob riding the two horses and doing those tricks. They looked like they were from the Wild West shows, you know? And um, they would spin us around and till we got so dizzy, we'd fall down. I would be on the boat dock and I would hear these from about a mile away. I could hear this whooping and hollering. And it was the Hayful boys coming down the hill. They had two horses and it was four of them on each horse, three or four on each horse and nothing on but swimming trunks. And they had um, baler twine for a bridle and they would pull down into the parking lot just as hard as those horses could run and they'd jump off the get our horses and run down the boat dock and all jump in the water. And then they'd all go swimming. And then they did that every day during the summer that it wasn't raining. As soon as they got done making hay, they hit the horses and down they came. He was just unbelievable as a child. An atlas built like a brick shit house. Best friends on the buddy system far from home. But war derails the best laid plans. The spans army don't give a damn. Dan's idea was to go in on the buddy plan, but his first day in basic training indicated that nothing was going to go according to plan, at least not his. Yeah, well, uh, like I said, I, kn I knew I was going, so I talked to a buddy of mine into going. I said, you know, I mean, he graduated, but just graduated stuff too, you know, but uh, he knew he was going, They're gonna be called it. They were drafted, so I was like, well, I said, Tony, let, let, let's go in and get it over with. A lot of the guys worried about getting drafted and stuff, and I didn't want to start something and then end up getting drafted, so, and I did want to go to the service, so. And I always kind of bullshit in the summertime. And, All right, let's go, let's sign up, you know. I said it's uh, this was during the summer, and they said we'd go in uh, the third of December is when we got uh, sworn in. December fifth is on uh, records. But I, I talked him into going, and okay, yep, yeah, uh, that sounds like a plan. Well, we get in the uh, army, signed in together. We. Fort Polk, Louisiana, here we come. We got into the indoctrination station, and that's where you get uh, signed up where you're going. Well, they took the two bus loads of us or whatever, and they had us all line up, and they're like, uh, okay, who in this group doesn't have a high school education? Okay, you guys go with Sergeant so-and-so. And that was the last time I saw my buddy until he was coming home. I, I seen him in Kansas City on the way home on the bus for Christmas leave. I was I never seen him again because <laughs> he had a high school education. Them guys all went on. They kept us back. And then we got signed to the next unit. And I was like, hmm. And here Tony was probably, oh, shit, he was Tony Adams. Oh, well, yeah, back then, I mean, well, he's still a best friend. But, uh... That's what we did He's like, time. yeah, we were probably uh, half a mile apart on the base, but you know, we just he was in a complete different unit. And I thought, oh man, that's that's kind of sad, <laughs> kind of sad. Yep. Oh, Palmia, set him free. 
Getting to Vietnam was one thing. Being there was quite another. The smell, the chaos was like something out of this world. When, when we landed at that airport up there, all of a sudden, just looking out the window, all of a sudden we couldn't see nothing. And here we're landing on a dirt runway. With, you know, and it's just like, everybody's gotta freak it out. Well, we leave from there after a two hour uh, overlay, took off from there and flew to Japan. And when on the way to Japan, we go through this <laughs> thunderstorm where, you know where they say the lightning can hit the plane? Well, this looked like it was doing it. I mean, that plane shook and rocked and, and when we get to Japan, now we got a five hour layover because there's how many rivets popped out of the tail section. <laughs> it's like they gotta fix the, run the plane in and, and put new rivets in it. And, uh, I don't know if that tail sex is very safe. <laughs> That's where the rivets all popped out. Well, when I got on in Japan, I got on first quick, so, and I sat right on the wing. <laughs> but now we get to Vietnam, and we can't land. We're up there flying around in a circle, looking out the window, and seeing these big, long lines of red fire just coming down out of the sky, just like a wave. And they were all tracer rounds. And this plane was uh, flying around the perimeter of the, air, uh, of the airport and uh, because they, they were being mortared. And, and we flew around up there for about an hour, just around in circles up there. And then finally, okay, boy, they started hollering at us. Like, when we hit that ground, we want you guys off of here filed out this way, Eat, you know, go this, then this row, that, you know, but I want you off of here. And man, when they took us off, I mean, we're going down these steps of this plane, and then all we're walking into is uh, tents. And there's guys going out, and, and I mean, we're walking down this out, and these guys are going out, they're leaving. Their, their year was up. And I'll tell you what, every one of them guys looked like they were 35, 40 years old to me. I mean, and they were still kids. They were they were 20 years old. They looked 40. And I'm like, oh, wow. Some of them like, good luck, man. Good luck, man. It's like, whoa. Boy, I didn't like this already. Stunk. Oh, God damn, my brother told me that's one thing he did say. And well, it was in his clothes when he came back home. His clothes stunk. So it's kind of like, well, OK. Uh, these guys are leaving. We're there that night when next morning we got roll call. And they call my name. Well, they go, 101st Airborne, Hayful, Daniel H. Boy, I stood there in line and I kind of, a lot of GIs out there. I'm looking down, I'm looking, looking down. It's got to be another Dan Hayful. No way am I in 101st Airborne. Mm -mm. I told him back, in, uh, I wasn't jumping. I am not in no airport. There's got to be another Dan Abel. And they call him like about three times each day. They call your name. Well, about third day, I finally answered. You know, and then that sergeant's like, Soldier, where in the hell have you been? And I said, Right here, Sergeant. I said, but I'm not no airborne. I told him back in basic I wasn't jumping out of no damn plane. And he goes, you're not in no, you're in an air mobile airborne unit. You're not gonna jump. He said, maybe five feet out of a helicopter. I'm like, oh, I can handle that. <laughs> Mississippi, it's the Mekong. 
farm boy knows his way around the land, but the jungles of Southeast Asia aren't the rolling hills above the Mississippi. Hayful knew he was out of his element. The thought of enlisting to do this weighed as much as his rifle and his gear. But it was just the fear at any time over this next little knob, around this corner, there was gonna be Vietnamese maybe off the side of you and then one right down the main trail shooting. You couldn't establish where it was coming from, but it was, it, it was a lot of encounters. They'd shoot a couple of us. By the time we'd get in line and get everybody organized, well, they could be gone. Or they might have moved over a few trees. And now, you know, and you can't see them in the jungle, so all of a sudden now you're being shot at from this angle. And it, it was usually two at the most, maybe three sometimes. But a lot of times it was one Vietnamese. And some of them, the hardcores, they would stay there and they would shoot at us until they run out of bullets. They'd leave their empty rifle, they'd leave their empty uh, containers, the cartridges, and they were gone. Sometimes their sandals, they even left their sandals because they could run barefoot through that jungle faster than they could have them sandals off. And they'd just be gone because they knew if they got too much going on, helicopters were going to be called in, gunships. Now they're going to, their chances are going to be bad. They're going to be killed. So they shoot, like I said, one, two of us, empty two clips, and they're gone. And a, a mile away, they know where there's another rifle buried, more ammunition, whatever they need, it's buried there. They, it's buried all over out there. We'd get into a, a firefight, and I've had bullets come right down a trail at me, and the last one just stopped two feet in front of me. And I got sprayed with just the dirt and stuff on my arms, and I rolled off the trail. But then I'm looking over, and this other guy, buddy of mine's laying on his side, and he's behind a tree. That's about like this. And next thing I see that tree just being shot off and falling on top of me. And it's like, wow. And then our guys are, are firing, and by that time, I'm returning fire. And it was just like, you know, it, it happened so fast that, you know, you don't realize what's even going on. And, and then it happened. And then it's like, okay. No, no. Hey, get up here. So and so, get over here on this line. And where's that machine gun? You know, get that up here. And it just it, it gets so hectic at first until you just, I don't know. That then everything just kind of kicks in. And okay, we're we're in a firefight here. And but at first it was just always know, scary for me. It was just like them rounds are. I can hear him, okay, I'm okay. It's when you stop hearing him, okay, that's bad, that's bad. I mean, got guys getting wounded alongside of you, you know, and, and, and you tell them, uh, man, you're gonna go home, man, you lucky dog. You're out of here. You, that's your ticket home, man. Whew. You don't have to face this no more. You don't have to be out here in the rain and mud. And, and trying to smoke a cigarette underneath of a poncho because you can't show no light. Otherwise, you're going to be shot at night. And just, you're out, man. You're going home. You know, well, thank God a lot of them did, but we didn't get it. got him what he gets. All he wanted was a cigarette. Delirious with fever on that ship alone. Such a long way from my home. From poisonous snakes to Syrian bullets and the sidious traps laid by the NVA to the disease-ridden insects constantly buzzing, 
if one didn't take you down, another one would. I just got sick. I just, I mean, uh, right now, I just like I had to throw up, but nothing to throw up, and I was just like, so the first time we stopped, I got the medic and uh, injected my temperature, and it was 103. And my company commander, CO, he did not believe me. He's like, no, 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 no. There ain't nothing wrong with that kid. That he, we need him out here. He's staying. And I was just sick. I just told him I was sick. I said, I don't feel good. And he made the medic get another thermometer, check me. That one, 103. And that captain's just like, no, no, this ain't happening. And he's looked at me, but have, have you been taking your malaria pills? Yes, sir. Because the medic brings them around and hands you one, and I didn't want no malaria. No way. And all of a sudden, this one guy comes out of nowhere, and he's like, what are you doing, soldier? And I said, well, I I'm supposed to go to a medic station, I guess, because I got 103 temperature. He goes, you don't look at God 103 temperature. And I said, well, the medic said I had it. And he goes, well, come with me. So, boy, here, then we went to an underground bunker. And I mean, it, it was bigger than the biggest bunker I ever seen. And I'm down there and, well, first this one lieutenant or captain asked me, he goes, what you doing, soldier? And I, I said, well, suppose I got 103 temperature. And he goes, supposedly. And I'm like, well, yeah, the, the medic out in the field. Told me I had 103 temperature. Oh, then he tells this other person, well, go get a thermometer. Well, then a thermometer, yep, 103. And then that when that colonel turned around, it was just like he knew. When he saw me, he's like, that kid's sick. We got to get him to a hospital. And next thing I knew, out of that bunker, here come a helicopter. They put me on it. We're flying, next thing I know, I'm looking out, all I can see is water. Water? Where the hell are we going? And here we went out and they took me to the uh, hospital ship, USS Hope, which was stationed just, just outside of Vietnam there on, on the water. So then they uh, took me down in so many floors in the ship. Got in there and the uh, nurses took me in and they run cold water on me right off the bat. And I'm like, I'm gonna get sick. And the uh, last thing I remember, she's like, go ahead, get sick. And I, I passed out. I, I come to it. She goes, well, I was wondering if you were gonna come back. And I said, what do you mean come back? She goes, well, you're out for five days. I said, no. She goes, yes, you were. And she goes, is there anything you'd like? And I'm like, yeah, I'd like a cigarette. She goes, no, there ain't no smoking on here. Oh. She goes, I want, I mean, like ice cream. And I'm like, oh, I want a cigarette. She goes, no, you can't have no cigarette. Oh, okay, well. She goes, you got malaria. I'm like, oh, malaria? Oh, I've been eating my pills. Nope, you got malaria. So it was probably that 15 to 17 days I was on the hospital ship. And then, uh, Doctor said, well, you're released, you're fit, you can go back to the company. And I was like, oh, no, no, I gotta go back to, I gotta go back to the company. This means go back out to the Ashaw Valley. Oh, this, oh, this. And I'm like, oh, can I? Because I found out the day before that the hospital ship was leaving the next day for Japan. And it was gonna be anybody that was uh, wounded or still whatever sick, was going to go to Japan for 30 days with this ship. And uh, the day before it leaves, he tells me, you got to go back. Oh, I want to go to Japan, no, sir. I want to go. <laughs> no, you got to go back. Your company needs you. Like, yeah, yeah, well, OK. Off the ship, he saw a sign. It's so grand design. Got her wanted by the 101. It's time to get out of the 
juggle like a fortune in At the time, Havel's malaria seemed like a gift from the gods, getting him out of the jungle and a chance to leave his infantry unit for a ride in the sky. Saw the thing on a uh, uh, bulletin board. Said they were looking for a door gunner for headquarters company. So it's like, well, this is gonna be good duty. This is, this is flying officers around. So it was like, well, I signed up. Next thing I know, uh, within a day or so, I got a call to the office and they said, yep, we're looking for gunners. Uh, I said, well, I can shoot them. Uh, and they're like, well, come back up tomorrow and we'll check you out. So I'm like, okay. Go back up the next day. They said, well, what you gotta do, we're gonna take you out on this course. And they got a barrel stuck up on a hillside and they come by about 80 mile an hour and they want you to shoot at this barrel and see how good you can operate this gun in the air. And I never did hit the barrel, but I came smoking around it and that was good enough. They said, well, you can come up tomorrow. We'll sign you on. So I was like, oh. So just my company was coming in I was going flying. Well, Dan and I used to write in-country letters. Uh, we had a couple back and forth. And mm -hmm. Dan wrote to me and told me how he got this job as being a door gunner. And <laughs> sleep between sheets at night and take a shower and, and go to the NCO club for a little bit and have a beer or something. I thought, oh man, <laughs> that sounds good. Well, and then, then I got to see that buddy of mine that was in the squad with me. He goes, so, you're going off to be a movie star. You're going to Hollywood. No, no more jungle sleeping. You're going to have a cot, your own dry tent to go into every night. I'm like, yep. And he goes, well, huh, going off to Hollywood. OK, movie star. And then that was the last time I seen that guy in my company and, and the last guy that I saw in my squad. I started flying. I'm out of the jungle, I'm dry, everything is great. You know, no, no more in the jungle. I, I got dry ground to sleep on, dry uh, cot at night. We're flying generals, colonels, majors. I said, I'm out of danger. Oh, I'm the upset I'm some kind of way out of here. For Sergeant Dan Hafel, the Aisho Valley is literally where people went to die. Gunner had three things he had to check on the helicopter before it even started up. And that was his responsibility for them three things. And then once the helicopter was fired and lift off, I gave the clear sign on the right and we, it was a clock system. I covered from noon to six. So if we're flying and there's a helicopter out here directly straight out my door, I warn the co-pilot and a pilot, then I tell them exactly what it is and exactly where it's at. And you tell them approximately how far away if you judge, you know. And then, yeah, if you take on rounds or whatever, then it's to protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, we flew out uh, uh, into the Ashaw Valley. Most, that's where our, our 101st Airborne was basically, uh, that's where their headquarters was at, at uh, Camp Sally in Way. There was Camp Eagle, Birmingham. And when we left there, we didn't fly very far and we was into the jungle deep enough to where, and you know, we just patrolled for 30 days. 
we flew out there, but we flew at 3,000, 4,000 feet. And the captain or the, or the colonel, major, all they were doing was on headphones with their company commander on the ground with the radio. And he's telling him what he wants him to do. We, we flew them out that they had their companies of men out there and they might be five miles apart or whatever, so we'd fly to the one, we'd fly around out there, he'd talk to him. Uh, very seldom would we ever land and talk. It was most air-to-air -air talk, telling him, I want you Alpha Company over here, I want Bravo Company here, and I want you guys. And once that was pretty much taken care of, it, it was back, back to the base. When the pilot made the decision to detour from a routine mission to get a new coat of paint and venture into the Ashaw Valley on a scout mission, Hafel's rank left him speechless. We were scheduled to go from Camp Sally to Fubai to get the helicopter painted on the top of the blades and our altimeter gauge fixed on the way. The pilot starts talking to the co-pilot. They just decided on their own that they're gonna go off of our mission and now we're gonna look at something that a pilot is gonna be flying into in the following weeks. And he wanted to see what it looked like. And the other pilot agreed. And my, if I could have had a voice, I would have said no. Yeah. There's one of them moments, immediately my gut just went sour. Just, this is not good. I was eight months in that fucking Ashaw Valley as an infantry grunt. That's a bad, bad territory. You don't want to go in there. But I can't say nothing because I'm just a peon riding in the back. It's like, well, here we go. I have no helicopter turned. I'm like, no, son of a bitch. I reach back, grab my chicken plate, which is just a vest that's solid lead. Supposedly it can stop a 50 caliber at a certain distance. Well, I put that son of a bitch on, reached out, grabbed my 60, brought it in. Well, we fly in. Yeah, it looked pretty good. Nice blue sky, and then pretty soon it got to these big white, the whitest puffy cloud you could ever imagine. And then we flew into it, and it was so bright, like just, I mean, wow, kind of like, boy, this is heaven, man. It's all right, That's, this is all right. Well, then we flew out of that, and then we flew into some clouds, and it was just that darker cloud. And then next thing, it went from that till I couldn't see nobody. <laughs> it was like, what the fuck? It was that much fog, it was so thick. It's like, where in the hell are we at? And are we flying? Are we moving? I had no idea, it just was so weird. And then out of nowhere, all of a sudden I see this son of a bitch and fucking tree limb coming right at me. And all I could get out in my mind was, oh my God. From beautiful blue skies to fog as thick as whipped cream, a helicopter with a green pilot and a faulty altimeter were no match for the a -show. When we crashed, the co-pilot, he ended up on the ground with a dislocated knee. The pilot went out through the window, uh, completely burnt, took all, burnt his clothes off on, uh, from his chest up and uh, tore his right knee off at the 
right below or Torres right leg off right below the knee and my crew chief he ended up with uh, the fuel from the helicopter dumped down inside of his suit and he had one of them fireproof suits but it burnt from the inside and uh, it melted parts of his boots to his ankles it burned at both legs everything just his buttocks everything was just third degree burns and I end up on uh, about 50 yards from the helicopter and when I came to I'm laying on my back I'm looking up 100 feet up into the treetop and there's the tail section of my helicopter with uh, half a rotor broke off it and it's just sitting there in the fog and the breeze just blowing back and forth and I can't get up but I can look behind me and I can see my helicopter on fire up there about 50 yards from me nobody around it was just foggy cold misty and then this big ball of fire back behind me uh, at first I thought I was in hell my crew chief Austin he comes upon me and he sees me and my shield is broke off the front of my uh, helmet and he goes uh, hey for you all right and I'm like yeah yeah I think so he goes well you you don't look very good because you look like shit he goes you got blood all over you and I'm like what he goes yeah you got a stick in your lip like, what and then sure enough I had a stick drove through the lower part of my lip and knocked my lower teeth back and took my false plate on top and busted it in pieces so they were no good and and then I asked him to, to help me get up and I couldn't get up I had no strength even to pull myself up by a tree and he tried to lift me he couldn't lift me so I knew right then my back was broken I said Tom I can't feel my right leg so I said you know go get out of here go get help whatever just get out of here I can't go nowhere get out of here and he's like no I'm gonna go see what where, where everybody else is at with bodies flung in all directions with incredible trauma how does Hafel, unconscious and on fire in his gunner's seat move 50 feet away from the helicopter with a broken back he found the, the co-pilot and here the co-pilot had seen me in the helicopter when it was sitting there on fire, he saw me in there and I was on fire. My, my right arm was, uh, the sleeve was burning up. And so he stepped out of the helicopter to, to come around and grab me and pull me out. But he said that's when he knew his right knee was dislocated and he fell to the ground and rolled a ways. And when he got back up to try to come up to help me, he said, I was gone. And he says, I don't know where you went. And well, I was 50 yards from the helicopter, down below it. And uh, Tom, my crew chief, said he never took me out. So uh, God got me down there. That's the only person I can say got me got me there was God. And I do believe there is that that the man above. And he he got me down there, but you know, 50 yards from it, I, I just don't understand what a broken back or right leg paralyzed. I, I don't understand that part of it. Soon the battered crew was in the hands of the NVA. The only question now was whether they would die or be POWs. Both options seemed horrific to Hafel. Uh, the Vietnamese had come in and surrounded us. They shot a bunch of bullets above our heads and stuff. And, uh, then my pilot, or co-pilot's hollering, uh, Chu Hoi, Chu Hoi, just keep hollering Chu Hoi. He said, that means surrender. So we're like, okay. So we hollered surrender and surrender. They stopped. A few minutes later, 
the rounds opened up again, just like a full-scale war above us. And I could just hear the bullets flying, and we started hollering, "Chu hoi, chu hoi, chu hoi!" Well, that gunfire stopped, and then out of nowhere, I had a rifle three inches from my head, and where they came from, never heard them, and they were there. They were, they had us surrounded. There, there. I know there was 30 of them at least, and they come in and. They uh, took my uh, pistol, took my holster belt, and then the one he'd put it on, and then he'd draw real fast, and then he'd, he'd try to, like he was gonna shoot me, he'd just bring it down, and then he'd stop right by my face, and then he'd, and he'd do, do it again, and he did that about four or five times, and I was just waiting for it to go off at any minute. I, I thought it was over, but then, the rest of them, they laughed and stuff like that. And well, then they just walked away from me. They knew I was not going nowhere. And then they went up and they took my crew chief and they tied him up with, on a piece of cloth or something. But uh, they left and immediately he was untied, but they knew he wasn't going nowhere. Because we, when we crashed, everything burned up in the helicopter. I mean, our, our flare guns, we had flares on board, everything burnt up to where Tom was taking our, my 38, and we were trying to hold the flares in our hand and then get the firing pin to come up and, and hit it. And, and knowing you're going to burn your hands for a little bit, but we we're going to try to get a flare up in the air because we could hear helicopters going in for the evening. And it was just, but they couldn't see us down there in the fog, and we had no way of telling them nothing, you know. And they, they just, we heard four or five choppers fly by that was coming back out of the Ashaw Valley. It was like no, no way to get nothing to them. I mean, we're we're just trying like hell to get that pin to, to go off on that flare, but the flare gun was burnt up. And it was like, oh boy, I hide in his sleep at all, no. No, it was a long night. Afraid to see what daylight's gonna bring, what they're gonna do to us. It just, I had horrible, horrible thoughts. This, this, this is the end. Well, I, I was gonna be hung up, cut open in the waist, and then just let your guts hang and then let pigs chew on you, because that's what I learned in basic training and AIT. It was like, oh. I don't want to ever be captured. That's the last thing. I, I don't want to be no prisoner of war. Oh, pal, me up, set him free. Missing in action. We got back to the family farm. The dead might be in harm. All they said was missing in action. Can't get no satisfaction. Back home, word got out that Dan's helicopter got shot down. No one knew if he was dead or alive. In the official military records, Dan was missing in action. His family is rocked to the core, but their faith gives them hope. I was sitting there in the reception station filling out my tax papers, and a sergeant reached over my shoulder and laid a note call home as soon as possible. So when that class was out, they let me go to a phone booth and I called home and it was my sister. And she said that Dan was listed as missing in action. I can remember mom standing there reading the letter about I'm going to be a gunner now and I'm going to be safe. And I can't remember if we got the letter after we got the notice that he was shot down and missing or if just before it was close together. I was just like everybody else, I was heartbroken, you know. We all thought he was gone. You know, we didn't think there was a hope that he'd come back. Back in those days, missing in action meant that there wasn't enough left here to ship home. The entire family was devastated. Um, I don't think I'd ever seen my father cry till then. Um, it was really hard on my grandparents. I, I believe it was 
one of their birthdays when he went missing, and it was, it was very hard on the family. Oh, pardon me. Children's just a shot away. Charlie is here. Will we survive this day? Death by bayonet or death by gun or a force march with nowhere left to run. Havel's back made him an incredible burden to his captors. Most likely, the only reason they didn't put a bullet in him is that his stripes got burnt off during the crash. Regardless, he was now in the possession of the very enemy that he'd fought face to face in his infantry unit. Next morning, right at the break of dawn, as soon as you could see, they were there. And they picked me up. They made my crew chief walk, but they picked me up and threw me on a blanket. Took the blanket, tied the ends to a pole. There was about five or six of them on each end of the pole and through the jungle we went and little stops on the way just to take a rest once in a while but otherwise they just we moved all day long until dark we moved through that jungle and carrying me along the way and just stumbling and and dropping me and hitting logs that are laying across the trail my back i i just I kept screaming until I just couldn't holler at him no more. I was crying. Put me down. You son of a bitch is putting me down. <laughs> uh, please put me down. Just stop, stop. And then after a while, then I'd tell him I had to take a leak. And well, then they'd, uh, I finally knew the word just listening to them. And I'd say that and I'd say that, well, then they'd stop. And then after a while, they caught on that all I wanted to do was stop and just, I pretend I was, God, I had to, but I hurt so bad, just, and then they, they end up hitting me with the rifle butt and uh, cracked my nose. We never got no water for the first three days. And I know my crew chief had to be just dehydrating so bad with them third degree burns. And I was worried about him, but, but I'm dying of thirst. And it's just, and after the, the third day that, that evening, when they stopped for the evening, they came with a five gallon can that you used to see back here. And they brought this water. And I swear to God, my crew chief drank three gallons. I, I mean, he just, I'm sitting there. And he's just, and water's running down, but he's just, and I'm just like, oh, God, that's, oh, I can't wait for my turn. You know, and, and it was just like, then they got me a big one, and I think I drank three gallons of water. It just was so good, so good. It was like, oh, finally, some water. And then after that, they, they gave us water, but I don't understand why the first three days, no water. In an instant, Sergeant Hafel went from missing in action to a prisoner of war. We was in a, I don't know what what it was, out just a little, uh, oh, I don't know what you'd call it, little camp out in the jungle. There was probably only about 30 of them, I suppose, around there. And then, uh, then they moved us to a camp 25 miles outside of Hanoi. And we was there for Oh, probably a year, I suppose, pretty close to that. Where when our captain asked us how long we thought we were going to be prisoners, uh, when we finally got to see him after a few months, because we never got to see him the first few months. Well, I guess we got to see him on the hillside one time when they, uh, B-52s was bombing. Every night they bombed. And the first night we heard them bombing out there in this, this prison camp, the first one that they, they carried us to after two weeks, 
we're laying there and, and here the United States had a, a bombing run that they were doing every night. And when we first heard it, it sounded like a thunderstorm so far off that it was so faint. But then as the month went, and it was every night, every night, it's like, wow. And then here it was getting a little closer. And then after about the 15th day or something, or that night, it was kind of like, these are bombs. This ain't no thunderstorm. They're getting closer. And the night when they, they quit, they bombed the other hillside from where we were at. And our pilot, with a dislocated knee, and they had a homemade set of crutches. But it didn't look like he was using them crutches going down that hill with napalm following him. I mean, there was a ball of fire up there on that hill coming down, and he was he was getting it on, man. Because if he wouldn't have, he'd have been burnt alive up there. Just There are wars and there are battles. While in Sante prison, Dan fought a battle with his body and turned a corner in his fight for freedom. But not all battles are won when the enemy is the one with the gun. <clears throat> one year, well, pretty much one year, and I stood up, and then... Uh, when I stood up, I stood up right in front of a four by four and I hung on to the wall because I, I was shaky, but it was really hard to get across that four by four the first time. But then each night I would walk. I knew how many steps it was in the room that I could make before I run into the wall and have to turn around, and go back the other way. And I did that. And I got my back strength, but I never let them know it. I never let them know it for another six months, probably. And uh, they saw me walking the one day, and you know, I was just kind of walking along. And it won't quit right away. Then they made me no homemade crutch. You know, or then I pretended to use it, but I didn't need it anymore. Oh, me up, set him free. You are not forgotten. For generals gathered in their masses They don't give a damn about our asses The troops are safer with the brass around Cause they won't go and she gets shut down Behind the scenes, the United States was planning a rescue mission months in the making. But even the most daring, courageous effort seemed like a day late and a dollar short. Sonte was in an isolated place, away from national power centers in Hanoi and Haiphong. It was on the other side of the Red River. This is the Sonte camp, as it looked in 1969. The small, isolated compound, located nearly 25 miles west of Hanoi and outside of the North Vietnamese heavy anti-aircraft defenses, was a nearly perfect target for a rescue attempt. On November 20th, 1970, a small helicopter-borne assault force landed in the camp, hoping to rescue some 50 POWs thought to be held there. Unfortunately, although the raid was executed without complication, the prisoners had routinely been moved to another camp about 15 miles away. Continued activity by Vietnamese remaining in the area produced all the outward signs of an active prison camp so that the raid was launched against an empty compound. Immediately after the raid, the North Vietnamese hurriedly evacuated all camps outside of Hanoi and moved all prisoners into the Camp Unity portion of the Hanoi Hilton. The problem with being a prisoner is the sense of being abandoned, the sense of being isolated. So Sonte was a dramatic reminder that, boy, they still care. They really tried their damnedest to get us out of here. And it was unnerving to the North Vietnamese. One night, they just packed us up during the night, blindfolded us, handcuffed us, and put us on trucks. And then they took us right inside the city of Hanoi. And then that's when we found out that the Special Forces was, had come in and uh, was going to try to free us. And somehow they got word of it and they moved us the night before the raid. And then, but then that Hanoi, that's that plantation, that's where I spent the rest of the time then that year and a half or whatever it was to make up the three years.
Station Garden, a shithole with a name. The tin can where the captured go insane. The meat hooked the rope trick and list kneeling on the floor. Or what is it good for? As Dan's captivity went from days to months to years, he made some lifelong friends and met some interesting characters, to say the least. I, I tell you, me and my crew chief, we laid there and we talked about our homes, our families, you know, what we did in high school, and how we grew up. I mean, we, I knew his life story, he knew mine, uh, what his favorite colors were, what he liked best to eat. But no, we then, you know, talked about girls back home, talked, talked to everything, cars. You know, I'm like, you're full-blooded Japanese. Well, uh, you know, how, how can you be an American? <laughs> you know? And what are you doing fighting this war anyway? <laughs> and we went back and forth about that a few times. What did he say? Oh, he was born in Hawaii, lived there all his life. He joined the service to be in the helicopters, and he got what he wanted. And, Uh, me and him, yeah, just in that Dennis Tellier, then he told us all about Rhode Island, and he was captured, he was a Marine, he was captured like two or, two years prior to plantation. You know, you, you move in with uh, seven other people, you had a lot to talk about. Uh, you could, some of these guys' stories, you know, it was like, now, that ain't the way you told it the last time because you heard it so many times, you know? I mean, everybody knew everybody's history, you know? It's like, no, no, you told us the last time your buddy did, you know? And then they're like, well, okay, can I change a little bit? You know, stuff like that, you know? And you, there was guys that were just their selves. They very seldom ever talked. They were just, other guys was, like me, I guess, just, hey, you know, have a story, you know, let's talk, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and this one guy, he just, I mean, he, he never ever said anything. And my captain, he's sitting there talking to a couple guys, and he goes, boy, you know, he says, I, I can remember when I was fat, dumb, and happy. And this guy's sitting over here all by himself, whatever, and he just goes, and you're not happy? And he puts his head back down, never cracked a smile, nothing. He just, we're sitting there, and all of a sudden it hit us, you know, like, huh, <laughs> you mean you're still fat and dumb, huh? Oh, yeah, and that was my captain, you know, he said that too. I thought, this is great. <laughs> and I mean, this guy don't smile, he don't, he just, you're not happy. Back down. <laughs> I mean, so everybody, I mean, there was, there was some of the guys I just, I can't live with you. you. You just stay over there in your side of the room and I'll stay here. I just. Oh, pile me up, set him free. My family's in a state of constant prayer. My work is here, but my heart's over there. My mother doesn't give a damn who. Word got back to Fama that Dan was indeed still alive. The entire city and hills around Dubuque rejoiced, and they knew Dan's grit, and there was no way he would ever stop fighting to find his way back home. What was his family going through every day? And, you know, the doubt, the fear, the, the, the uncertainty of whether their son would come back, and, and when he did come back, you know, what kind of a person would he be? How would he be changed? I was stationed down in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I was in transit. My family didn't know how to get a hold of me because I just left Fort Lewis, Washington three days before that, and I had no idea where I was going. So, and I called home that morning, and you know, they said he was listed as a prisoner of war. I think I was nine. 
I really didn't understand what it was when, you know, when we found out that Dan was captured. I remember seeing my dad cry and um, that, that really tugged at my heart. <laughs> Very shocking, you know, of course, <laughs> sad, but ironically, uh, I had a dream when he was when he was missing in action that I went to the mailbox and saw a letter. I had a letter that Dan was a prisoner of war. And the next day, my mother called me and told me that they had word that Dan was alive and they figured he was a prisoner of war. I needed to go out to the Hayful farm and meet the family. They couldn't have been more gracious. Dan's parents, Thomas, Florence, they were just delightful people. The Hafels weren't just concerned about their son. They were totally focused on that. They welcomed me in, but they didn't pay much attention to me. The first time I went to the Hafel farm, I didn't know if it would be an easy meeting or if it would be a tense, difficult session. It couldn't have been any easier. Dan's mom, Florence Hafel, was a warm, outgoing woman. She made everybody around her feel comfortable. She was the person who, if she heard her son was coming home from the war, she was worried that she wasn't gonna have time to get the house clean. I can't even fathom what, what she went through, um, but her faith was strong. Um, all of the Hafel's faith is strong. And I'm sure, knowing grandma, she gave it to God and, you know, said, he's in your hands. She was more a, lot, a good support to grandma and grandpa, um, you know, that we were, we lived clo so close by each other, you know. They came up to our house a lot. I can remember grandma and grandpa sitting at the kitchen table, and yeah, so I think just to keep them busy. And I can remember grandma having the vigil, a candle burning 24 seven until Dan came home. A lot of times we knelt on the floor and mom led the rosary, and we'd pray that before we'd go to bed. And... Dan's father, Thomas Hafel, was a quiet man, friendly man. He spoke more with his smile than he did with his words. He was a very bright guy also. He'd raised a big family, and now one of them was in trouble. He was, he was pretty quiet. I think he probably thought if he started talking about it, he'd maybe cry, and he wouldn't do, didn't want to see that, so. See, I kept in close contact because the Major Salimus, Ron Salimus, lived in Davenport and we lived in Bettendorf. So we became very close friends. We were back and forth and course, that was the main subject when he would come to visit us, you know. That, uh, and he was always reassuring very much reassuring that Dan would return home, you know. So, yes, he, yeah, we cherished those times with him because I, you know, it brought me a little closer to the, you know, that Dan was gone and that he would, he would come home. He was always mentally tough. And I think that's because of his brothers, his older brothers. They took care of him, you know, but they picked on him a lot. And he was always a butt of a lot of their jokes. And I think that helped develop his character to the point where he didn't let anything bother him and he wasn't going to give up. He knew there was, no matter what happened, that there was better days ahead. Well, we were made to pray, that's for sure. And I, I'm sure the prayers helped. But you had to make things go on. Like in normal life, you know, you had to, had to do it and keep on going. That's, you always was in your mind, you know. You know, when you wait that long, I'd lay there at nights and think, is he thinking of us now? There was almost a telepathy that you could feel. I could feel him. Not for God's sin, find the cost of freedom from interrogation. Trading secrets brings damnation. Hateful stood up facing grievous harm. Never would betray his brothers in arms. 
Every day his captors tried to turn the POWs against the United States. Hafel noticed that some American prisoners were getting special privileges. One day he had just had enough. We were dead, you know, as far as everybody was concerned you know, that I thought. Because like I said, we never got no word out, no nothing. And until I knew that they put my name over the Hanoi radio, that now my mom and dad's gonna know that I'm alive and I'm a prisoner of war. But until like 1972, late 72 was when I first uh, found out that they put my name over, over the radio. And then that's also when we were allowed to write a letter home. But what they wanted you to do was play, go on their side. They wanted you to write, actually they would write it and they just wanted you to sign it. And it was to say that the United States is warmongers, we're child killers, women killers, and stuff like that. And so they could have your name and everything, and they want you even to then go on the radio and call the United States warmongers and stuff. And if you did that, you got more privileges. You got more food. These doors didn't get not shut at night. They stayed open. So it wasn't hot in the room. And we had about, I don't know, 11 guys in our camp out of 80 some that they did. They just literally, communist sympathizers. The North Vietnamese were determined to turn as many prisoners as they could for propaganda purposes because the North Vietnamese played great, uh, placed great faith in the anti-war movement, sapping the will of the administration to continue the war. And a way to do this was to show that the prisoners of war have adopted uh, the ideology of Marxism. People who are turncoats and they get all these favors, uh, I mean, your your final 19 had to have, I mean, I can't imagine they were able to hold up without a profound, two things, a profound sense of religious faith that, that they will eventually, you know, that, that, that there, you know, there's, not, there's something better than this world here, and a, and a profound belief in hope. I mean, honestly, you can understand the turncoats. I mean, given all of the physical privations, the suffering, etc. It's, it, I, I don't think one should condemn too much turncoats, even as you have to admire the supreme patriotism of those prisoners who didn't buckle under those horrific circumstances. As in most decisions in Hafel's Vietnam experiences, there were a few miscalculations along the way. The American prisoners, you know, they collaborated with them. They got extra benefits, they got extra food. They had their doors open in the evening, during the day. They could go in and out freely during the day, where ours was an hour out and then back locked up, and that was it. Well, them guys, they didn't even have their doors shut, and it was hot. Well, the so one day I just, I said, I, <laughs> I can't take it. I said, I ain't going back in. And they're like, hey, well, we, we wouldn't advise that. And I'm like, what's the worst they can do? Throw me in solitary? I don't care. I, I don't care if I get thrown in solitary. I know every one of you guys' stories, I said, probably even better than you guys know them. I said, I've heard them so many times. I said, I can sit alone and just think all them stories. I said, that's no problem. Oh, hey, well, I don't know. Well, I refused to go in. Well, then I got forced in. Okay, well, two hours later, door opens up. Fun, fun. And that was my name given to me by them. And I'm like, what the fuck you want now? Grab your shit, your 
blanket and your tea pot or your watered thing, you're going with us. Hmm. Everybody's sitting there, them seven other guys are like, Yeah, I told you, April, something's gonna be happening. I'm like, yeah, but I ain't worried about it. Well, they threw me in solitary, which was fine, but then here they come with these fucking iron shackles and they put them around my ankles with the three quarter inch rebar going through that sticks out a foot or better on each side of my feet stretched out. It's like, I never planned on this. Son of a bitch. Oh, fuck my back. I, oh, I can't sleep on my back. Not whatsoever, it just kills me. Oh, fuck, how am I even gonna sleep in this son of a bitch in room? Well, and it was a four by six or a four by eight, whatever. So I, I'd have to get the bar shoved all the way up that way so it's sticking out here like that. And then get to where I'm on my side and then let the bar either lay against the wall this way or let the bar hit the wall that way. And but then if I want my sides hurt, I gotta roll. Now I gotta pull the bar way back through this way. Uh, fucking roll. Stand the bar up against the wall. Oh, this sucks. This fucking sucks. Well, then, about the, oh, I don't know, week or so, all of a sudden I got fucking sick. Just out of the blue, just, oh, stomach turned. Oh, what the hell's going on? Okay, well, I told them they didn't pay no attention. Well, one day went, second day come, told them I'm sick, I don't feel good. And they're like, nah, you just went out of these shackles and went out of solitary, that's all. I well, I think it was the third afternoon they came in with a, I don't know if he's a doctor or not, but he had a white coat on and he came in and he pricked my finger smeared it and then here at nine o'clock that night here they come with a truck into the compound unshackled me got me on the truck i had no idea what was going on oh, While in solitary, Dan got just about as sick as a man can get. The NVA finally realized he was at death's door and rushed him to surgery. They took me in, into the city, uh, and then next thing, they got me in the shower room and they're scrubbing me down. And then they take me in, lay me down on this table, took leather straps, I want to cross my ankles, one across here, one across my chest. And then they had my hands tied out like that. The doctor, he's filling up this needle, the syringe, and pulls everything out of the bottom, and he just starts squeezing it off. And I'm laying here on the bed watching him, and he's squeezing it off. And just as the stream come out the end, the whole end of that glass tube just flew right off of that syringe. And he screamed a bunch of shit in Vietnamese. He just dropped the syringe, and he grabbed my gut, and he just, he took the knife and just, and I'm laying there, and I could just see what's going, and I see the knife coming down in his hand. And then he's got me, and I'm like, oh. And it's like, oh. And I'm laying there, and then I got this guy sitting behind me, a guard, and he keeps poking me in the fucking forehead and he will not stop. You must not cry. You must be brave. Do not cry. You must be brave. They want to kill that son of a bitch so bad. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you if I get loose. Oh, he just, oh that's, a, that's a mean torture. Don't ever do that to nobody. And I mean, he just kept it up and I know he was trying to get my mind off what was going on down here, but it was like, I feel that, and now I feel you. I'm gonna get to both of you guys. Oh, it hurts so bad. 
And then uh, they just kept wor working on me, and I'd pass out. But then I suppose then they'd go, but then I'd come to, and it hurt so bad. I'd just lay there, just tighten up. And, and I, I wouldn't breathe. I just hurt so bad. <laughs> and then he just, it felt like he was taking his whole freaking hand and shoving it inside my stomach and fucking around in there. And this guy, he was still back there just, oh, he, oh, he. <laughs> Yeah, if I could remember what he looked like today, I, I'd go and do that to his forehead for about an hour. <laughs> you son of a bitch. My hand was out on these freaking stainless steel fucking, I don't know, they looked like little cups. And they, my hand was all tied to them, and the, they, they stuck past my hand like, that far, this one came loose, and it just come up so fast. From and I hit this nurse that was standing alongside of me, and I caught her just above her eye, and I laid it wide open, just blood just immediately on me, and it, she grabs, it. she goes around, and I'm, and I'm watching her, and she goes over, and the doctor quits with me, he goes over. Gauze it a little bit like that, and then he just starts to sewing away, and she just sat there like nothing fucking happened. Just well, three o'clock in the morning, he put the three stitches in, and I, I watched him go. I didn't see him go through it, but I felt it go through, and then I seen the thread come up, and he put three stitches in, and, and then he goes, "You brave, you brave." <laughs> You fucker, you got me hurting. Oh, you got me hurting bad. Uh, they put me back in a solitary room. And they came in about every two hours or so, and it was like 15 shots. I mean, like seven or eight in this one, and seven or eight in this one, just, oh, my arms got so sore for three days, like they just kept pumping me with these needles. And then after the third day, they took me out, moved me in with my other seven guys again, and they were to take care of me. For Dan's parents and family, every day there was hope for something, anything, that would give them an encouraging sign. Dear Mom and Dad, I hope this letter finds all of you in the best of health. I sure hope you and Dad are taking real good care of yourself and don't want you and the rest of the family to worry about me because I am fine. I still have you and the family in my heart and in my prayers each night. I still love you, Dad, and the family. I hope this letter brings joy to all of you. Love, Danny.
While Dan was paying the price for this bloody war, back home there were forces trying to end the conflict once and for all. Prisoners were a very vulnerable point for the for the United States because we have such a we we have an ethos in our military, and it's a very and it's just why our military is so effective on the battlefield of never leaving anyone behind. So prisoners kind of besmirch that ethic, and so. Nixon in particular was obsessed with bringing the prisoners home. Yeah, they started even broadcasting it uh, on the radio once in a while. Hannah, Hannah would say something about it, about the peace talks going on in, in Paris and and stuff like that. And then this was like in October then of uh, 72. We had heard, I'm sure it came through the communications on that though, from officers or something hearing it from some because it come down the line through through the walls that uh the paris peace talks fell through in december and then that's when they that christmas they bombed they bombed the hell out of that city on christmas of 72 and then that brought them back to the peace table and the peace talks and then in January, they signed the uh, thing saying that, okay, it's officially over and you can start bringing your POWs home. And... Prisoners are an extremely valuable intelligence source. So if you have pr prisoners, you want to exploit them for all they're worth, which means you have to turn them. So both sides uh, try to turn prisoners over to their side. And so the fact that there were some defections amongst our prisoners in the North is is, is is really part of the process and is to be understood as as part part of the game they just needed to get the americans out of there uh that they could not win this war with the americans so heavily engaged nixon you know campaigned on ending the war and was determined to quote achieve peace with honor so in a sense both um both parties sort of abandoned the war for other things For Sergeant Daniel Hafel, one of the final 19 prisoners of war to come home from Vietnam, Operation Homecoming was all about seeing his family. When they when they did say well, you're going home, then it was like, wow. And then they get on that plane, and just as quiet there is no noise whatsoever. All of a sudden, the pilot comes across. We're out of Vietnamese airspace. The fucking plane blew up. Just, yeah, everybody fucking screaming and hollering like, yes, yes, yes. We ain't gonna get shot down now. <laughs> oh, we're home. We're going home. Oh, and, and then all of a sudden the nurses, they started to come up and down the aisle. And then here come the one with the Army Star and Stripes and had an article that uh, yeah, because it got released the 27th, because the 24th is mom's birthday, and it had an article in there, it was the happiest birthday she ever had. You know, it's like, wow. And then the, go to the Philippines for three days, or two and a half, whatever. But then the 30th, to land in Denver on my dad's birthday. It's like, ah, what more could I ask for? You just can't, you can't imagine how it felt. I mean, you just, because we were so, we were all so happy to, we were going to see our brother. Oh, it was the greatest news we had gotten. I mean, that news spread so fast. I know they told my dad, he worked at John Deere's, and he screamed so loud, I don't think you needed the telephone to hear him. It was, it, was, it was great news to hear that. 
I remember watching TV, and I think it was when he was getting off the plane in the Philippines, and we were like, oh, there he is, pointing him out, you know, and then it was then it was just kind of like a rolling ball, you know, then mom and dad went to Denver, and then, then come back to Dubuque. I don't know how many, seven or eight of us went to the, went in the motorhome and went to Denver to meet him, so it was a big crowd. <laughs> what was it like hearing that? Oh, it was just, made everybody happy, you know, it just, everybody just felt like celebrating. Just, we were tickled. You, I guess you can see some of the pictures in the mo motorhome where we were enjoying ourselves, so. It was fun, fun getting there and, and anxious to get there, you know, so when I got in there, all I could say is he, he was looking for his sister, Kate, and because uh, uh, I was like his mom to him, he said, so of course that made me cry. <laughs> so anyhow, I finally got to hug him, really realize he was there, you know. And they had this red carpet <laughs> stretched out for us to get off the plane. We're supposed to walk down the salute, the captain or whatever at the end of it. I was doing fine till I looked over. <laughs> There's my whole family lined up. <laughs> Fuck you in the end. I cut the shortcut. <laughs> Went running over and here I was running away from my brother Tommy. And I thought it was my dad. Oh, got closer and I was like, oh no, that's Tommy. There's dad. <laughs> like, wow, Tommy, you changed. <laughs> Look more like dad than ever. <laughs> yeah, and got there and then finally a couple of the officers come on, come on, we gotta get in, in the car and go over to the hospital. They had a birthday cake there for dad. From Denver, they flew to Dubuque, and all that pain turned into a big party that would last for days. It was the happiest day of our lives. Describe it. Oh, it was amazing. Everybody wanted to talk to Dan, and Dan took the time to talk to everybody. Oh my God, I remember that. Um, my dad had a limousine. He had bought this limousine. It was black. It looked like a hearse. And we drove that in to Dubuque to the airport and we're all in the airport and this is before it was remodeled. So it was packed, it was packed. And um, a woman came over the intercom and said, immediate family only on the tarmac. Yeah, right. It emptied. There were so many people out there, so many. Um, it, it was just unbelievable, it was just unbelievable. But I remember looking at my dad and he had started to tear up a little bit, um, you know, and, uh, but I remember getting to Dan. I don't know how we did it. I don't know how we got to Dan, but we got there and Dan grabbed me and I was in his chest, must have been on this side where all his medals were. And he grabs me and my chest is, or my head is right here and my face is in them medals. And he's a hugging, Jenny's over here and he's just hugging tight. And all I could remember were, my God, he's got a lot of medals because they're in my face. And when he came back, I, I had a little band that I sang and played the guitar. And when they brought him back from the airport, I was at the airport when he got off the plane. But when they brought him back from the airport to the municipal building for his celebration, I played and sang for that party. And everybody kept asking me to play Oh Danny Boy. And that's all I know of it. <laughs> oh Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. So I just kept singing it and making up the words as I went. And I must have done it 10 times that night and sang 10 different verses of just making it up, but not a soul noticed. Flowers are dying. Tis you, tis you After we got his convertible, we went back to the house and the majors and colonels and everybody was there. And he had awarded him with this medal and he'd hand it to my mom. You can see in his face, he could give a shit less. 
And then they give him this, I forget what it was, bronze star with a cup of old leaves for saving his company as they retreated. Boy, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy's a hero. So last medal, hands it to my mother, and looks at me and says, let's go. Never said a word to them guys. Out the door we went. Got in the car and I said, man, did you really do that? Well, the F word come out. Absolutely not. The son of a bitch has left me. End of discussion. Dan came home a hero, but he also came home a combat veteran with a broken body, a haunted mind, and a hope to bury these chapters somewhere in the past. Because when I got free, I, I, I remember going in and, and just buying a pack of cigarettes. And then I walked out and I, as far as I can throw it. What'd you do that for? Because I can go back in and buy another pack. I'm free. I'm free to do what I want now. I'm home. This is what I've been waiting for. This is why I wanted to come home. It was kind of ironic. You know, it was at first, when I, when Dan first came home and I first started hanging out with him, it, it was like being around a ghost because he wasn't supposed to be here. And everybody thought he was dead for so long. But then the reality just set in that it's still Dan. It's the same guy. He hasn't changed. It's Dan, no matter what they did to him, he lived through it and he's still the same guy he was when he left. And that, that part to me still amazes me that he's, he's the same guy that I knew my whole life. Whatever they did to him did nothing to change his personality or his outlook on life or the way he looked at life because I couldn't even imagine some of the stories and being so afraid to sleep and sit in a circle, you know, stuff like that. They're kids, for Christ's sake, you know? It, it's scary, so. And like after I found out, like when I read the book and he didn't have water and he was thirsty. The first time when we were sitting at his house and I was sitting on the couch and I had a glass of water and I just started crying. I went, Dan, I never realized that you were thirsty in your life like that. Dan, you need to tell your story. You know, you need to go to the high schools and tell your story. And one night when he came over for a massage, he said to me, he goes, Sherry, he goes, do you know what I did today? And I said, what did you do today? And there was a hateful out of Western Dubuque. And he goes, he told his story in front of junior high, or uh, juniors and seniors at their high school, at the Western Dubuque High School. And he goes, and girls were coming up and they were in tears and stuff like that. And they were saying, thank you for your service. And I looked at him and I said, do you know how many um, supper tables, you are going to be a conversation of tonight, Dan. There are going to be so many kids that are talking about you. Well, Dan was two years ahead of me in school, but we rode the school bus together. and So we knew each other, lived a few miles apart. And then when I, Dan got released, I was uh, home on leave. And I said, well, shouldn't Dan remember who I was? Come up to Steve, how's it going? And, well, and then he, I said, Jeff, well, shouldn't. Let's go for a ride quick down to the way across down here. We walked out, he had a 750 Honda and I had my 67 electric light. He tried to get on, I said, no, I'll hop on the back and meet mine. So he did, and he went down to the way across and drank a beer and we were back in 15 minutes. On the way back, Dan tapped me on the shoulder, he goes, you slow it down? He said, I just got back from Vietnam and I want to live. I said, no problem, I shut the bike right down. Put it back into Luxembourg and Dan goes, I'm going to get me one of those tomorrow. Yeah, okay. The next night, I went to a party up in Millville. He's come rolling in, and I see this big blue dresser there. I go, whose bike is that? And just like that, Dan comes walking down the hill with a blue windbreaker on, says Harley Davidson, carrying a beer. Wow. Eventually, Dan went on to meet a girl named Sue. 
She was seemingly handpicked to handle this complicated man. The first time I met Dan was on my birthday. I think it was my 21st birthday, I think. And I just kind of attacked him that night because I needed birthday kisses. <laughs> and then it was about a week later when I met him again. And it was uh, JB, a friend of his, was playing down at the, at the bar that we go to. And he was sitting at a table. They were drinking old granddad. And he passed me the bottle and I sat there and drank with him. And before we knew it, we were the last two at the table drinking and <laughs> that was the beginning. And then he then he left me alone with his box of goodies, his all his memoirs that his mom had kept. And he went to Arizona for a week and I went through all of it. And read all the telegrams and all the tel the paper clippings and and I spent a week crying. <laughs> it was just like it was amazing how anybody could go through that and survive and come out as normal as he was, or what I thought was normal. <laughs> Dan got into the Midnight Riders Motorcycle Club and found the camaraderie that he felt with his fellow cellmates in prison, banding together, acting as one. We got to know each other after I got out of the Navy. And I started the club. And in our club, you earn your patch, you don't get it free. And I'm thinking, boy, how do you ask somebody who's been a POW for three and a half years to prospect, you know? And Dan goes, I want to earn my patch. Oh, that took a lot of load off my mind. He goes, just don't make me run. So he said, no, nah, we won't do that. And a few months later, he got voted in unanimously and got initiated and survived that. Got to be one of the best brothers in the club. We appreciate the club. We know that they're there for us no matter what. Whether we're the one of the girls or with, with our guy or whatever, it doesn't matter. They take care of us. Good brotherhood. And we helped a lot of veterans organizations out because a lot of us are vets when we started the club. We just partied a lot then. Yeah, yeah we partied a lot back then. Yeah. A lot. To complete the picture, Dan and Sue had a boy named Jesse. Growing up, that was the normal for me. As I got older, I started to realize how special that really was and how unique of an experience I had growing up with a father that was open to talk about his experiences in Vietnam. Uh, a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about that time for one reason or another. Um, but my father has always been incredibly open and any question I had, he's always answered. And I, I realize now how, how rare of an occurrence that is to, to have that opportunity. They still live in the hills above the Mississippi River making the most of his freedom each and every day. What did I leave over there? I hope I didn't leave anything over there. I don't think I did. No, it's what's over there is over there and it stayed over there and whatever it is, it's there. I'm here, that's... No. To come back whole from Vietnam is in and of itself impressive, but he says that he didn't leave anything behind, but I, th I believe that he left negative emotions behind. I've never heard my father talk in a negative light of the Vietnamese people. I've never, he doesn't have hate in his heart for his time over there. I think he wants people to realize that this this happened. These guys went there, they did their job, whether it was right or wrong or whatever, this is what the, they were told to do. Um, some bad things happened to good guys and, and that's a war. Um, something bad happened to him, but you go on with your life, and you don't dwell on hatred. Freedom is great. Freedom is, it isn't free, but it's great. You know, you still, you know, I, I'm not a prisoner, 
So I, I can get up and go when I want, do what I want. So freedom is great. So